competition takes place among all kinds of animals. Vertebrates for their prey. Humans in business. When competition takes place between different species, for example, between predator owls and predator cats for their rodent prey, that's called interspecific competition. But when it's within a species between individuals of the same species, it's called intraspecific competition, like these business people, or perhaps these fish. I'm not sure if those are the same species or a different species. Resources are what is competed for, and there's a lot in common between predator-prey and consumer resource interactions. These similarities were discussed through the last century by ecologists, and in 1982, Tillman defined competition, excuse me, defined resources as any substance or factor that increases population growth re rates as its availability increases and is consumed. The superior competitor can persist when resources are more limited. So if the weaker species needs more resources to survive. In this example, species B is able to, sur to survive and outcompete A when resources are limited. Resources may be considered to be in two categories, renewable, that are continually replenished, and non-renewable, once consumed, they are taken. And a good example of this is space. Because if something's in a space, it's not available for anything else. There is a dynamic coupling between consumers and their resources, and the population size of consumers is limited by the size of resources. The equations used to describe these interactions are also the basis for predator-prey models, so all these things are related. Space is non-renewable, and you can see in the left-hand panel some bare rock as the barnacle population is growing, but eventually everything is all crusted up and there's no more space left. Krill are an example of a renewable resource, these tiny little animals that are eaten by many marine animals that filter feed and consume tons of them. So here's another invertebrate with a hard shell, mussels, that are a resource for sea stars, also called starfish. What kind of a resource do you think these are, renewable or non-renewable? So by definition, all resources are reduced by their consumers, but not all resources limit consumer populations. You can think of how food limits populations of consumers, but oxygen in the atmosphere is unlimited, or populations don't grow to take advantage of all the oxygen. So resources do have the potential to limit their availability versus the demand for them is important. And in 1840, Liebig proposed his law of the minimum, which said that populations are limited by the single resource having the relative great, greatest scarcity. Nowadays, we know that two or more resources can interact to become limiting but this still holds true. Resources for plants are nutrients and light, and here you can see there's an interaction. That fertilized plants with ample nutrients can use light more efficiency, efficiently. On the y-axis, the dry weight, an indicator of the amount of growth, and you can see at the higher light levels, there's much more growth in fertilized plants. Jacques Monod, a French microbiologist in the 1950s, related p 
population growth rate of bacteria to a single resource and the numbers or amounts on the y-axis here not labeled time on the x-axis the populations grow and the resource levels are diminished until a critical level of resources is reached and the population ceases to grow any further. We call that critical level R star. Dave Tillman did some neat work to show that two different nutrient, two different resources can limit populations together. Looking at the growth of diatoms, diatoms are tiny phytoplankton that are like little petri dishes, well, cells inside petri dishes, they're silica frustules, and they use silicate to make those. So silicate and phosphate both influence the growth rate of diatoms. In the upper corner, the Monod-type equation showing how the availability of silicon dioxide, silicate, is limiting to growth. But in the bottom picture, a diagram with increasing levels of two different resources. They're critical levels marked with a star, and only when critical levels of both are reached can the populations grow. But if you look at it the other way, whichever resource is, limit, is reduced to its critical level, R star first is the one that will limit the population. Specialization and generalization has something to do with this type of ecology, too. We can describe patterns of resource utilization by consumers, for example, insects on host plants, or maybe tropical fruit-eating birds, looking at how fruit size correlates to gape width, the amount they can open their bills, if you're a bird with a smaller bill, you can only eat fruit up to a certain size, but the larger the bill, the larger the gape, those birds can eat a wide variety of fruits. So there are words we use to describe levels of specialization. A monophagous species uses a single resource. An oligophagous species uses a few, and polyphagous can use many. But competition arises when species use the same resource. There are density-dependent birth and death rates, and these can be seen within a population, of, of within a species. It's this that limits the growth of populations and restricts it to a certain size within the limits of the environment below the carrying capacity. But interspecific competition takes place too, and this can lead to the reduction or disappearance of one population, one species, or excluding it entirely from the resource. We call that competitive exclusion. Or maybe that species will change so much, you know, its evolutionary trajectory will change from competition. So natural selection, <clears throat> how evolution proceeds, is the expression of competition within populations between individuals having different genotypes. So that's a definition of intraspecific competition. One of the first experimental demonstrations of competition was by Tansley in 1917 using bed straws, species of galium. These are small perennial herbs. Galium saxatile grows in acid peaty soils in Great Britain, galium sylvestri is found on limestone hills and in pastures. When grown singly, each could grow alone on each soil type, but when grown together, one outcompeted the other on the acid soil, the other on the limestone soil, and this is the soil where they are found in nature. So here's the experimental design that he used to study these battling British bed straws. In a common garden, with equivalent sun, rain, and temperatures for all these plants. Growing them alone, both species persist in both soil types, but in acid soil, 
only one persisted, in calcareous soil only the other. I think this is a good time to talk about the niche, which is an ecological space. I like to think of it as an n-dimensional space with each axis in this multi-dimensional space being one of the parameters of the environment. The fundamental niche of a species is its idealized use of resources in the environment where it exists alone. The realized niche, however, is narrower. It's the actual use of that species of the resources, which, are, which is modified by competition with other species. So I'd like you to think about, and we'll talk about this in class, what are some dimensions of this multidimensional ecological space known as the niche? So a niche is a multi-dimensional and n-dimensional space, and we can portray that space, condense it down to a single line that we might call the resource continuum. And we can look at these simple illustrations of Gauss's competitive exclusion principle which is simply stated as complete competitors cannot coexist. If two species have exactly the same niche, they cannot coexist in the same habitat. Because where their niches, if the niche of A is the first hump and the niche of B, species B, is the second hump, where they overlap, that's the zone of competition. If they are equally good competitors, the niches will diverge. If, they're, if one is better than the other, it can push the other one to specialize and may, may even make it go extinct. So this zone in here where the niches overlap, this is where competition is. And niche divergence means there's less competition. When two species of paramecium were cultivated singly, they both reach a maximum and the populations don't grow bigger than that. But when they're grown in mixed culture, one outcompetes and competitively excludes the other. Latka and Volterra made mathematical models to describe the interaction of two competing species, N1 and N2, the change in population size of species 1 is equal to little r times n, the intrinsic rate of increase of that species, times its population size, multiplied by a factor, which is how close that species population size is to its carrying capacity k1 minus n1 over k1. The same for goes for the population growth of species 2 with 2 substituted of course so that the growth for each species is regulated by its own by competition with its own individuals intraspecific competition. But their population growth interacting is further depressed by the presence of the other species. And for this we can define competition coefficients, alpha and beta. Sometimes alpha could be written A sub 1, 2, which is the effect of species 2 on species 1. And beta, the effect of species 1 on species 2, a sub 2, 1, the other competition coefficient. So if alpha is equal to 1, the effect of species 2 on species 1 is equal to 1, that means both species are equivalently good competitors. If alpha is greater than 1, that means interspecific competition between those two is greater than the intraspecific competition of species 1. And if alpha is less than 1, that means intraspecific competition is more important. 
So in other words, alpha is the per capita effect of species 2 on species 1, measured in units of species 1. So we can elaborate those competition equations with the factor, with the competition coefficients included. In the numerator of the quantity in brackets, we subtract the competition coefficient times the population size of the other species over the and combine that with the other terms over the carrying capacity of the first species. So in the equation for n species 1, we use alpha, the effect of species 2 on species 1. In the equation for species 2, we use beta, the effect of species 1 on species 2. Those two coefficients measure the relative importance per individual of inter- and intraspecific competition.